Hi everybody, this is the London Clujurians. Uh, today we have uh, William Parker with us. Today William Parker is gonna introduce us to the logic programming with Clara Rules. Clara Rules is a, a rule-based engine. It's an implementation of the Riti network. So uh, the presentation is gonna be 30, 40 minutes or so. At the end of the presentation, we're gonna have um, 15 um, minutes of uh, Que um, uh, question sessions. Uh, so yeah, at the end of the presentation, you should be able then to unmute yourself and ask the question directly to to William. So William, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. If you can share your screen and start the presentation. Okay. Um, now, can you see the screen and hear me? Yep. Yes. Good. Um, So yes, so you see the original problem that was trying to be solved with Clara was just business logic that was getting out of hand and very difficult to um, express in really either a functional or object oriented way, um, which sounds very abstract. So I'll be showing some concrete examples of this later. Um, but the idea is just to have the logic resemble as much as possible um, a domain model that would make sense to somebody writing a requirements document um, while still having the full expressivity of code. Um, again, this sounds abstract and perhaps a little academic. Um, I'd just like to point out SQL, which is very common, has some of these um, characteristics as well, where you are expressing what sort of data and what relationships you're trying to find without expressing anything of how to go about obtaining it. Um, so, I so this should be um, a somewhat familiar concept. Um, um, so the primary goal is to just be understandable and to improve developer efficiency. Um, but secondly, Clear has been used on some problems. It's certain that we're processing very large amounts of data. Um, so the per performance requirements on this were quite strict. Um, so this has been quite heavily optimized on the JVM um, to, as a reference here, thousands of rules, um, gigabytes of data that could be hundreds of thousands of facts. Um, now, while Clara does support ClojureScript, in the interest of full disclosure, the ClojureScript side has not been heavily optimized in the same way. Um, Clojure Script would pick up the algorithmic improvements, but a lot of the fine tuning of hotspots would not carry over to Clojure Script at this time. Um, secondly, on this slide, uh, we also wanted to efficiently update when a single piece of data changed, and that could affect arbitrary parts of the system. So you might have, say, 100,000 records pertaining to all sorts of various facts. These might be um, lab results. These might be medications that somebody was on. These might be um, appointments that these had had with some medical provider. This could be essentially anything. Um, and this could affect any number of hundreds or thousands of different conclusions that you might draw about the, the patient. Um, and we want you to be able to change any one of these um, in response to new data or add a new data point, remove a data point, and very quickly be able to respond back with the new state of all conclusions that we drew. Um, this is something that would be particularly difficult to implement without a rules engine, to be honest, because if you, 
implementing this for uh, each particular algorithm, each particular rule set would really be quite a chore. Um, time here. Now, the word rules engine does have a bit of baggage, I think, associated with it. If you Google rules engine, you will see a number of products that um, say that they want to eliminate the need for developers. We'll have all our business logic without, without code. Um, no developers, no code, um, none of this. The problem with this is, is that when you get into highly complex logic, you really need something code-like in order to express it because the problem is really expressing it in a precise manner. So what you tend to end up with is frankly, in some of these cases, poor code, um, code that's maybe in a GUI with no text, that's therefore not in source control, that therefore has no test, um, and that also doesn't integrate well with other code systems. So very much when I start with Clara, the objective was not to be an all-encompassing development environment. The objective was to be a library that will integrate with other, with Clojure code, with other Clojure libraries. Um, it, since it can use Clojure's interop to work with other things on the JVM, Etc. Um, and indeed, you ultimately there is an escape hatch in that you can go down. You can write your own arbitrary closure code that will be used at, within clearer rules. Um, the restriction there being that it needs to be stateless and immutable. Um, but that's I'm pretty much inherent in the programming model is will I think will become clear with the later slides. So I'll take a very simple example here. Um, this is a rule that is stating that if there's a temperature reading in a location that is with a temperature of less than zero, that it is cold in this location. Um, so you can see that the you know, def rule, cold rule, a name. The, the, the left-hand side, which is the um, condition in brackets before the arrow, is what we call the left-hand side. These are conditions. Um, so if you think of this as an if-then statement, this is what becomes before the if. And to the right of the arrow is the then. Um, so you see a bit of the syntax here um, with that the equals question mark location location is binding the symbol question mark location to the contents of the location field on temperature reading. Um, Clara will reflect on the schema of the temperature reading record there and detect that it can assign that. Um, and so when you, the right-hand side there is executed, it will have that value. Um, then the second expression there, less than temperature zero, is not binding anything. Again, that's looking at the field on a temperature reading fact and evaluating the code less than. Um, and that could be any closure function. Um, that could be something that you wrote yourself. Um, anything in core, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then this will be, and this right-hand side will be executed for every temperature reading that meets this condition. Um, I would tend to think of this less as uh, action being executed though, is something where you're asserting that a cold should exist. Um, so in terms of the logic programming, you're saying that if 
there is a temperature reading that it is cold. Um, this is just a, something that is true. Um, and you don't really need to be thinking about um, anything that will be called. Um, rather than just this is a logical relationship that should hold true. Um, so starting it on the code sample that I posted, that I put in the chat. Um, so we'll take a, a simple rule here. We want to say we're doing something in commerce and we want to find the maximum discount available for a purchase and apply it to that purchase. You see in a functional style here, this is looks like a pretty simple problem. We take the purchase, we have a function that finds all discounts related to it, we find the maximum one um, and apply it there. I guess actually there that should I think that should be I suppose men in this case, because I'm multiplying my still set by it. <laughs> Oops, but I think you get the idea here um, of that function. Um, similarly here, um, we have final price with Mexico rule that we have every discount record, suppose that this is a record somewhere, um, we find the maximum value of discount rate. Um, we join that with, a per with purchase records and for every one of those insert final purchase um, with the price updated. Um, again, I believe that should actually be min because of the way I did the math there, which is slightly embarrassing, but <laughs> anyway. Um, I will update the um, repository later. But a few things, more things about the syntax to call out here. Um, this accumulator here is going to take every discount um, and find the maximum of that field there. That So if that was not there, we would in create a final purchase for every purchase and discount combination. This would be a Cartesian join um, between every discount and every purchase. Um, but we don't want to do that. We want um, to have a single final monetary value for each purchase. Um, so we accumulate there. Um, when, and when you have two um, condition, when you have two conditions here, that's going to be a Cartesian join between them, keeping in mind again that this is an accumulator there, so it's a join, a Cartesian join between a one element set and a, and a many element set. Um, so this doesn't really look too complicated in either case. If this was the only problem I was solving, I probably wouldn't use Clara. Um, but suppose we want to add some more onto it. Um, we want to say define a new type, define a new type of discount, and this discount means information about previous purchases. If we want to do this in the functional version, um, we would need to potentially pass it in through the call stack, which is what I did here. Um, you could potentially have a dynamic variable that that you set above, so implicit arguments. You could have global state if you really wanted, but one way or another, your call stack that is dealing with clicking the final price is going to need to think about um, passing in previous purchases. Um, and this might be annoying, say, if the team that owns creating um, discounts is not the team that owns this price calculation. Um, so on the other hand, take an example down here of a Clara rule, um, where we create a new, create a rule that inserts something that matches a 
discount condition, and this will automatically be picked up by the previous rule. So if I have previous purchases that match this constraint here, um, and that there are at least two of them, then it will be, then we will insert this discount here. Um, and then you note know, here that this fact um, matches, this has, an, and that is an interface there, that discount that is defined if you look at the code that I pushed up. So when this gets ex executed, Clara will say you have previous purchases um, and that meets the constraints here. So there is a recent purchases discount in the session. Um, and since there is a discount, this will be considered in this condition here. Um, and the and it will up with the purchase and there will be a final purchase created um, in the session using that discount potentially if it meets the if it is the one that the accumulator chooses. Um, and again here, when you create this discount, nothing here changed. The user did not need to wire any of this together. Um, you just stayed the logical relationships and Clara wires it together for you. Um, so, you know, really still though, this doesn't look especially complicated in the functional case, but let's add something else on now. Um, we want to calculate foreign exchange for the user. Um, so now if you want to calculate what the user will pay in foreign currency, um, you again, this still needs to be concerned with previous purchases. Even though if I'm calculating the exchange rates, passing in previous purchases, or whatever other customer relationship info may be available to determine what discounts we should offer, really is kind of annoying because I'm just not concerned with any of this at all in this that sort of logic. Um, on the other hand, if you take a rule um, I have an example implementation here. This rule here, for every customer, we bind the customer ID. We see if there is a billing address um, for every distinct country here. Um, so to note here, this the exist, which is an, actually is in the end an accumulator, and other accumulators will create will match once for every distinct set of bindings. So this will match for every value of country um, for that customer. So that will insert that in the session that for this customer, um, they may want to pay in this currency. Um, then this will then be joined up with a final purchase that was applied after discounts um, we'll get the exchange rate for that currency to that customer's from the currency of the purchase to the currency that that customer may wish to pay in and insert an offer for them to pay in this for in this currency um, for the purchase. If there was more than one billing address, if they had in different countries, perhaps, um, this would insert multiple um, offers for them to pay in those different currencies. Um, now, and this will all be, again, be wired together by Clara. You'll note that the user is not doing any of this wiring themselves. And you'll see, and if you look in the, I guess, later slides and in the GitHub project that I posted up when I went through some of the sessions. Um, again, the user's not wiring any of this. Um, similarly, if say we wanted to change the logic later to decide how we determine what the customer currency is, um, 
say we detect that if they're coming from an IP address in a given country, that they may want to pay in the currency of that country, we could add that too as an additional rule to add another option for them. And that would just be one additional rule and nothing else would change. The discount calculation wouldn't change. Um, the way we look up the exchange rates there wouldn't change. Um, it would just be one rule. Um, so here, yeah, I give the link here again. Um, this is as well how the API is will be called. Um, first, we call we make the session for the rules in this namespace. Um, it's often convenient to use a namespace to organize rules. It doesn't actually have to be that way. Um, just so you know, you can pass in just a sequence of different rules to use, but it's often convenient to use a namespace. Um, we insert um, these different rules, um, and then and then we fire um, the rules. So when we so after we call fire rules, Claire will work out all knowledge that can be found um, about from the input facts and then it will plug them into the rules. Um, each rule that matches one of these, any combination of these facts may create its own facts. Those facts will then be added and used to see if they match any rules and the logic will just cascade. Um, and the result here being is that you can see that um, we are able to query for the um, FX payment offer. Um, I don't think I have it on the slide. It should be in the repository. That is um, a query that is looking for these FX payment offer facts and it will return any of them that are in the session. So we'll see that that offer was created with the exchange rate at the time that I looked it up and did the demo um, for that created, even though we, even though you'll note that again, this rule here, final purchase, customer currency, um, none of those is being inserted directly. Um, they're being transiently created and creating this FX payment offer fact. Um, so, now, okay, so we have this. Say we want to assert something new here. We have some new information come in. We now know that we look up and find that the customer had some previous purchases. Um, so we take it, so we take the previous session and now we insert the previous purchases in and fire the rules again. We're calling that we had a rule before that went from previous purchases to a discount. Um, as you can see here, um, that's 8.01 pounds. The previous one was 8.9 pounds. So when the previous purchases were picked up, um, it uh, then updated the payment offer there. Um, and note that the previous offer of 8.9 no longer exists in this session, or it no longer exists in the new session that we created. Um, it was a full, full logical update to logical consistency, and the results of this are going to be exactly the same as if you took the previous facts here and just stacked previous purchase, previous purchase on top of that um, in the initial call. Um, so also to note here, we did off of example session one. Example session one is not going to change. Clear sessions are immutable data structures. If we call query on example session one again, we would get the exact same result. Um, now, there's a, now when fire rules is called, there is a fair amount of statefulness in the calculations internal to Clara um, to optimize performance, but before and after fire rules, and from the user's point of view, everything is an immutable, persistent data structure. Um, um, okay. Um, 
So now to, or say if we remove things as well, we decide that one of these purchases, somebody recorded it incorrectly. Um, and this purchase didn't actually happen. And we retract it out of the example session too. Um, and we're now restored back to, as you see, the original um, payment offer that was present from the example session one. Um, so, and again, these sessions are immutable. Example session two is also unchanged. Um, as you see here, Clear will do, I know here I created this map pre to previous purchase. This is a new call that is being created. Um, Clear effects work off of um, equality, not identity. Um, so while it might perform a little better um, if you actually serve the previous instance of the fact, um, it, um, it, since some equality checks would short circuit on identity equals, um, that is not required. You just, you insert a new, va a new fact that is logically equal um, according to closure equality and the fact that was previously inserted will be removed from the session that is returned. Um, so this is called truth maintenance. Um, there is some discussion of this on the clear, clear documentation. Um, something to note, there are some functions in Clear. There's insert unconditional um, is probably the most common one where you can opt out of the truth maintenance um, and there's reference to the documentation. But I would really consider those lower level things. Um, they can be necessary sometimes, but really my first resort would be to use truth maintenance because when you do that, um, all these when you use insert unconditional right hand side manual retracts, etc., um, all these nice properties about logical relationships resolving themselves go away, um, and you have to take that on yourself. Um, so this sort of resolution of relationships can be useful. Um, another big piece of functionality I'd like to call out is that since these rules are discrete pieces of logic that's defined independently um, and Clara has to keep track of the results of each of these rules to resolve these issues, to um, update the logic as I just discussed, um, you would think that it would, might have some useful information stored about how it reached different conclusions and that would be correct. Um, so this is an instance called inspect in Clara. Um, we have an example here where one of the pieces of information that Clara will return, we call this, is it will return a map of each fact to an explanation of why it um, was inserted. Um, as you see here, we have the FX payment offer facts. There was one of them in the session, so we filtered um, for keys where the key is an FX payment offer. And you see here, um, this is actually a map that would be a single column in the REPL, uh, but that didn't fit with the slide dimensions very well. So the left-hand side is the top, the right-hand side is the bottom. Um, we see here, we have a map that's the fact, and then we have the rule that inserted it. And then we have the actual fact that cause the rules to fire um, and the bindings that were used when the right hands are executed. So you can imagine for one thing, this could be quite useful in debugging. Um, if there's, I find that there's something in my session that I don't, didn't expect to be true. Um, you know, say I wrote a bug and I, um, and I have a customer in the UK and I was serving a payment offer for them in some country that they have no ties with. I might go and look here to see why that was being created. If I then see the customer currency, I could go back and look at um, why that fact was created and um, integrate back down to determine why my erroneous data exist. 
Um, and maybe that could be, of course, bad data input, that could be your bugs in your code that you would then fix. And there's a couple other keys like this. Um, you could look from the point of view of a rule and see all the facts that are inserted. You can look at a condi individual condition within a rule and see what that matched. Um, so there's a fair amount of information to explore in the REPL um, for debugging. And there's actually enough here that you can put, build tools on top of this as well. So this is very much a developer-oriented tool. Um, potentially, if you could develop some kind of UI for your domain on top of this, um, if that was something that was useful to you, because this is a intended to be somewhat human readable, um, but it is also a consistent data model that can be processed by code. Um, So a bit on how this is implemented. Um, from Bruno's comments earlier, I may not have gone um, into the implementation as much because I wanted to focus on other things in the talk, but I'm happy to take questions on that later if people want more details. Um, but this uses the Reddit algorithm, as has been alluded to, and this ultimately ends up um, and creating a graph of fact flows that a fact will be inserted at a root at a root node and it will be then flow downward as it matches different conditions and when it stops matching a condition it will again not not flow further down to the children of that node um, but clear will keep retain the information of how far it went. Um, and so the, um, the leaf nodes in here are ultimately going to be the executions of rules, the right hand sides or query results. Um, I think the classic source for this is Doran Bose's thesis on the matter. Um, there's a, a number of other places that you, know, that you could Google for as well. Um, but I guess something that this is, I think the classic source. Um, so this is what I have read when working through Clara initially. Um, I think it's important to note though, though that some of the academic sources in particular are quite old. Um, and that some of their optimizations that they talk about are frankly coming back from a time when we did not have as much computing power available as we do now. And so some of them really are pretty, are not really all that useful, at least in the domains we've worked with, I think with Clara to date. Um, so for example, when it talks about things like we can't do garbage collection, no, we just use the JVM's garbage collector. Um, so the un stuff that talks about unlinking does not happen there because we have, have not seen um, storing pointers to Java objects in Clara's implementation to be a um, performance limitation the way it might have been in the 90s. Um, yes, Wikipedia is a fairly I looked at the article in the reading algorithm, it's fairly decent. Um, there's some stuff in the drills documentation, drills being another rules engine on the JVM um, that was to it is to some general read algorithm stuff as well. Um, in terms of the ultimate performance characteristics of Clara, as a perhaps as opposed to something like backward chaining rules. Um, Clara is going to derive all knowledge that it can greedily up front. Um, so, and actually when you do a, run a Clara query, um, you're not really deriving any new knowledge at the time of the call stack because the query results are actually pre-computed, the same as a rule. So 
I guess clear is doing as much work as it can up front. It doesn't care if you're asking about it yet. It will take your input facts and derive all possible knowledge from them up front. Um, whether this is useful or not will really depend on your use case. Um, in the case of some of the things that Clara was designed to target, um, we had use cases where batch processing up front was relatively cheap, um, and we did, and we doing a lot of work then was not a big deal. But we wanted to be able to apply minor updates and fully work out the consequences of those updates very quickly. Um, so in this case, that was actually a benefit. Um, Yeah, a bit about the more more about the performance characteristics. You know, if you have a Cartesian join um, between sets of facts of different types, um, ultimately this is an O of M in problem. M, you know, M being the size of facts of set one, M being the size of set two. If it's a set, if you're joining three different sets then it's, you know, again, multiplying by the size of each set. You know, this is not a problem that Clara or any other library could solve because it's, it's just an inherent problem of um, doing joins. Um, that said, if you are doing joins that are purely on equality fields, um, so you want to say that, again, the, say an ID is equal across different facts. Um, Clear will allow you to do that based on a hash join, and so things are stored in a map. And so the size of your join that you compute is only things that have that same ID. So ultimately, Clear will store that. I sort of have a map of that ID to. Um, the facts with that ID, and it will only use those when it is computing the join, um, which is what you would expect from many data lookup systems. Um, this, there's some, um, there's a page in the website for Clara about how you make sure that um, you're taking advantage of this when you have joins of this nature, but if you're just calling your own predicate um, that is a black box to clear it, it will have to execute that, that predicate um, every time um, for each of the puzzle pairs. Now, when I see empirically clear, I can still perform pretty well on pretty sizable joins, even if your predicate functions that you're calling will keep our performance. Um, that said, let me see, ultimately it's, a problem that will um, degrade again O of M N. Um, another pretty significant um, characteristic limitation is that Clara requires that all your facts be able to be stored in memory. Um, there's been some discussion before of potentially creating implementations that would um, be distributed somehow, but nothing like that exists at the moment. So everything needs to be able to fit in memory um, at this time. Now, in general, Clear has been optimized to wire the rules together in an efficient manner. Um, that said, it is possible to end up in poorly performing use cases if you hit some kind of edge case or just some sort of characteristic like your rules that is performing badly. Um, in that case, it's possible to effectively hit declare that which rule should be executed first. Um, I guess hint is not perhaps the best word because it will consistently respect this. But I see th things will be more maintainable if you rely as much as possible only use this ordering to um, optimize the performance of firing the rules rather than relying on this for correctness. Um, 
And again, if you're using purely the truth maintenance managed insertions, um, this should be the case that any salience you add will only be necessary for improving performance. Um, a couple other topics that I wanted to touch on, but didn't want to make full slides on as in the interest of time. It, it clearly has some functionality where you can ser serialize sessions. So you can create a session and serialize it out to disk um, and load it back up again later and then carry on inserting and retracting facts out of it. And the work that was previously computed um, will still be there. So if you have you know, a, a thousand rules and you serialize it, you deserialize it only, and you insert a new fact that matches one rule, um, only that one rule will then need to be, and it's downstream consequences, of course, will need to be executed again. So this gets back into the supporting efficient updates um, on arbitrary pieces of the rule session. Um, I showed the, the accumulators. Um, to um, recap, that's um, going back to the max here. Um, example of this max or this, this is another example of the accumulator count. Um, this is getting the count of purchases that match um, that can that match that condition. That is an accumulator. Um, Clearer supplies a number of out of the box accumulators for reasoning out collections of facts. Um, and it's accumulators name space, but the user users can write um, their own accumulators and that is really a pretty normal use case. Um, it's just you have to write functions that um, again, are non-stateful because it's going because Clara will manage the state um, that is related to them. Um, and if you you can see this third point actually if you just create a rule session and you go into a REPL and type in the variable name for it. And you'll see, and see the value that exists there. This is a consistent data structure, actually. And so you don't actually have to create new rules with def rule and def query. It's the most convenient approach at first. And it's what I would start with. It's what I would use if I'm manually coding rules. Um, that said, there's a consistent data model and you and if you pass those data, those data structures in to make session, Claire will create a rule session out of them just fine. So what this allows you to do is that you can have code that, that generates rules from some higher level specification specific to your domain. So, and I've actually worked on several things before where Clara was essentially a compilation target. Um, for some other DSL um, or some other library. Um, and so I see here, this is, you know, the, there's a, there's questions in the future. There is the Clara website. Um, there's the Clara Slack channel. There, and there's also a mailing list on Google Groups. Um, I'd say the Slack channel is a bit more active, um, but there are people who look at both. Um, I guess something else to note, if something is causing users confusion, if that keeps coming up, say in Slack, this would is useful to know because this would, um, there have been things in the past that call it, that, got added to documentation or had air handling approved around um, basically because it was apparently a source of confusion because it kept coming up. So if um, finding out about these things actually can be fairly useful um, for those of us um, contributing to the library. Um, and I guess I'll 
open up to any questions now. So, yeah, thank you very much for, for the presentation. I think it was really nice. And uh, thank you for taking the time to prepare all this. Um, I want, just as a reminder to everybody, so the presentation is going to go on YouTube uh, in the next few days. Uh, if you uh, like this type of presentation, this type of content, subscribe to the Meetup page and subscribe also to the YouTube channel. And uh, if you want to present something, uh, you have a, a topic or a library that you want to present, please get in touch with me and I'll uh, set up in one of the next uh, sessions. So thanks again, William, and uh, see you to everybody. You're welcome. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.